just like this. This time we don't need it. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Ooh. Ooh. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this event. Uh, I want to thank uh, GCC for hosting this event. And I want to thank facilities, media. Mike, thank you. And I want to thank the panelists for taking the time and coming here and re representing their views. I also want to mention that the Philosophy and Religious Studies Department sponsored this event. The title of the event is Genders and Sexuality, Current Controversies and the Common Good. We have four panelists. One of us uh, is here for the first time, so we welcome Dr. Jeffrey Ventrella. Next, familiar old friend of ours, Richard Klaus. Thank you very much. And we have, of course, our own Dr. Jean Santamore from the philosophy department. And then there is this other person that will talk to me. So let's begin. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. the order of, uh, of the presentations will be, uh, Dr. Ventrella will be first, our guest, then Richard, then uh, uh, Jean, and then myself. So let's begin. Thank you. Well, there's certainly better things to do than listen to us on this beautiful day, but I'm delighted you're here. I'm delighted to participate in this particular dialogue, and my goal is to foster uh, clarity. It's to foster conviction and hopefully to foster courage as we broach a very important current topic. And make no mistake, sexuality is an important and current topic. As we all uh, cringed last fall, we saw Weinstein and Lauer and Spacey and Keeler and Rose and Goodman and Conyers and more. Moreover, sexuality is a topic that necessarily touches upon the three taboos of polite society. Because to address this, we do have to talk about sex, we have to talk about uh, politics, and sometimes we even have to talk about religions. It's kind of a threefer at that point. I'm in. I'm in the game to talk about those things, but how I came to be here to talk about it, as the professor said, my first time here, is a little bit odd. Let me just, uh, personal privilege, explain. When we were talking about these things, they confirmed the fact that I'm a lawyer, and then they asked me if I believed in the Constitution, and I said, yes. Do you believe in the First Amendment? And I said, yes. And they said, do you believe in free speech? And I said, well, of course I believe in free speech. They said, good, we want you to give one at Glendale Community College. So, <laughs> so here I am. You know, when we consider today's topic, we ought to consider also how to dialogue about it, because that's what this session is about, dialoguing. Dialoguing critically, not cynically, but critically. And we ought to ask the question, so what? What's really underneath this discussion? in addition to being repulsed, as we all should be, by bad behavior of the people that I just identified. Because what's really at stake here in society is quite important and far-reaching beyond individual practices. What's really at stake is more than bad behavior. Rather, what we're dealing with in the big picture are competing models for joy, competing models for human flourishing. Model number one essentially affirms this, or asks anyway, must I ignore, deny, or even suppress 
whether that's psychologically, medically, surgically, or sociologically, must I ignore, deny, or suppress myself in order to most fully be myself? That, of course, presupposes some form of disintegration as a precondition to human authenticity, which, of course, is a Gnostic move or perhaps a Neoplatonic move. Or model number two is this. Must I endeavor to integrate and align myself with who I am to be most fully myself? We need to ask, what and where is the operative evaluative principle here? Where's the standard? Is it exclusively internal? Is it exclusively external? And what about history? This implicates what I believe is the foundational question driving sexuality and the common good, our topic here. What is mankind? And there are two paths to consider, two questions for us to ask. One I would call technos. It asks the question, what can mankind do? The other is telos. What is mankind for? And these are separate paths. Let me give you a number of implications to our topic today. One is the language implication, or how is it that we have a critical dialogue about these things? Consider a thought experiment. If one calls his car water, that's one thing. However, if he puts his water into a garage and then closes the door, what happens, if anything, upon reopening that door? Will he be greeted with a puddle? Of course not. Calling or labeling a car water does not mean that it becomes liquid. Tom Wright explains, he says, we are not, as humans after all, defined by whatever longings and aspirations come out of our hearts, despite the remarkable rhetoric of our times. In the area of human well-being, what I'm calling flourishing, that is the road to radical instability, he says, and in the area of theological beliefs, it leads to Gnosticism. So we need to start asking key questions to address this critically. What is mankind in relation to sexuality? Does biology matter? Is biology bigotry? Are we simply, as one critic said, meat skeletons? We have accidental and incidental flesh between our legs. Sorry to be crude, but that's what they've said. Uh, are we mere expressive individuals, internal? And if so, we have to overcome the critiques of people like Roger Scruton and philosopher Charles Taylor. And what about love? Isn't that subsumed in our topic at some point? Is love ex exclusively externally focused, other-oriented, self-giving, including our fertility? Or is it merely internally focused, self-focused, self-taking? We all become Frank Sinatra singing about my way as the highest good. Well, there's a corollary then, number two. How language attaches to real reality? Can it be known and what is it? Do we best conceive of the human person as some sort of protean Mr. Potato Head where you can put parts wherever you want to put parts, lop parts off, make distinctions and design completely irrelevant? And those evident distinctions and designs must therefore conform to one's subjective desire. And if they're not, then we bring in the arm of the state, the sword of the state, to enforce those subjective desires. Therefore, are we leading to a society, a common good? That means will trumps being in design. Let me just say Alliance Defending Freedom is a 501c3 nonprofit entity, and the fact that I use the word Trump has nothing to do with anything political. I'm using it in the old sense. A number of people can help us here. One, Nancy Piercy says, under all the hype about sex as fun and games is actually what Melinda Selmas says is a fundamental despair. Uh, Melinda is a formerly identified as a lesbian, now says this. Beneath all the pageantry of free sex and self-love, there is a fundamental belief that the body doesn't mean anything, that it is insignificant in a literal sense, signifying, signifying nothing. You can do anything you want with it. She continues, you can pleasure it with a vacuum cleaner or you can give it away to anyone for any reason. It's sort of a wet machine, a tool that you can use in exchange for whatever purpose suits your fancy. Does that promote the common good? Real reality and language matters. Number three, 
This debate touches upon societal and relational implications. Piercy summarizes and says, when sex is reduced to an exchange of pleasures, the other person's personality becomes a burden. Selmis again. If the purpose of sexuality is mere pleasure, sooner or later the, later, the other person with all their personality and all their own separate desires is going to become burdensome. The ideal then becomes no names, just sex. Now notice, when we make that move, it has societal implications because it smuggles in, it latently alters the definition of freedom and the purpose of choice. Economists are good at this. Jennifer Roback Morris is one who says, if we define freedom as getting the outcomes we want, we can't remain in relationships and still be free. This definition of freedom places freedom and relationship in opposition to one another. It places a higher value on autonomy than relationship. And the only way to resolve that conflict, she says, is to end the relationship. Social commentator Oz Guinness puts it this way, even relationships become now renewable in short-term increments, not unlike a magazine subscription. The delete button is always only one click away. Today in America, even marriages are severed with a text messages. Is that a good thing? Then we have the other implications, the medical and healing arts implications. Uh, philosopher and commentator Oliver, o Oliver O'Donovan saw this 30 plus years ago where he said, gender ideology raises in a sharp form the question of the use of medicine, now get this, as an instrument of social management. For in conceding that there is no medical rationale for this surgery, why? Because it attacks a healthy physiology in order to satisfy the demands of an unhealthy psychology. This ideology overrides the traditional limitation of medical ethics, that when we invade the human body, it ought to be attended for the body's good. He says, of course, transsexual surgery is certainly intended to do the patient good, but it is not a medical good that it is doing her, but a social good. The patient's body was not meant to be an instrument that could be disposed of in one way or another. And he gives the rationale. Not everything to which people will consent or which they will even demand is the right thing for medicine to undertake. Bodily health is a good and it is to be pursued and it is to be valued. And one of the problems here is where are the hermeneutical breaks? How do we limit this if we just say, well, it's only for what's been called sexual reassignment surgery? For example, if it's just about my desires, think of Monica Mares and Caleb Peterson. They are lovers. They're also mother and son. Monica's abandoning her nine other children because this is what her heart's desires. So she's now sleeping with and has been convicted of incest uh, with her uh, son. Or think of Nick O'Halloran. Nick O'Halloran's in the UK. I was just there in, in Ireland. He believes that four inches below his hip is some type of an appendage that doesn't belong to him. He's searching for a surgeon to lop off most of his right leg. And you've seen kind of weird situations where it's really heartbreaking to people do all kinds of modifications to their bodies. But think of what the woman who self-identifies, she calls herself the cartoon lady, where she had six sets of ribs removed because her identity was to have a size 13 waist and resemble these various cartoon characters. Or think of in Canada and elsewhere, we have now a 52-year-old man who's decided to identify as a six-year-old girl, abandoning his wife and family and so forth. Now, I'm not evaluating that so much as simply describing this sort of hermeneutic provides all kinds of societal consequences. Think of Chloe Jennings White, the able-bodied woman in the UK who, since she was about four, identified as a paraplegic when she saw her aunt wear uh, braces designed for polio. She's searching for a surgeon who will sever her sciatic nerve to make her disabled because of this. Or think of Jewel Shupi, who's age 30, beautiful woman, whose therapist, psychologist, put numbing drops into her eye sockets so that they could put a drain cleaner to blind her. Why? She identifies as a blind person, though her physiology is perfectly compatible with health. So these are the kinds of questions we have to ask. It's not just limited. 
yet there's some hope. There's hope from the academy. In fact, Paul McHugh, uh, the chief uh, psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, ended sexual assignment surgery in 1979 by saying this, we psychiatrists have been distracted from studying the causes and natures of their mental misdirections. How? By preparing them for surgery and for a life in the other sex. We have wasted scientific and technical resources and damaged our professional credibility by collaborating with madness rather than trying to study, cure, and ultimately prevent it. This also has implications in other movements and so forth. This particular move uh, pushed by gender ideology takes apart the notion of, uh, shall we call it, genetic or born that way sort of issues that the LGBT community utilized to make certain advances uh, in the legal system. Again, I'm not commenting upon that, but I'm saying it is on a collision course. If you say this is hardwired and then you say it's fluid, uh, through a construct called gender, there are problems there. The APA now is rejecting this as are other activists. It simply can't make sense. So where are we? Well, we end up with the legal and the political kinds of issues. Notice the move that's going on here. The law does what? The law draws lines. The law sets boundaries. The law is an application of what we call ethics. But that's not what the law is being asked to do here. The law is being asked to get out of its lane of ethics and start pronouncing metaphysics, ontology, being. This is a problem. Stella Morabito explains, she's the Yale graduate, CIA analyst, and now is a columnist, brilliant woman, says this, once you basically redefine humanity as sexless, you end up with a dehumanized society in which there can be no legal mother or father or son, or daughter, or husband, or wife, and here's the money quote, without the permission of the state. So what we're happening is you're taking pre-political realities and shoving them into the political milieu. The state has the unprecedented power now to micromanage families. She says, if you abolish sex distinctions in the law, you can abolish state recognition of biological family ties, and the state can regulate personal relationships and consolidate power as never before. The state decides who counts as parents and children. When gender is denaturalized, parenthood will be denaturalized. There's a host of other political issues. The notion of a false anthropology or defective anthropology being imposed. The notion that we can now consent to sterilization, even for minors, and when that consent is withheld by the child's parents, we see courts now intervening, as they did last week in Ohio, taking children away from their parents because the parents said, let's be cautious about giving puberty blockers and so forth. What if consent is held? It's like we're going back to Buck versus Bell, where we sterilized people against their will. This is what we did with lobotomies, God forbid treating mental health challenges with surgery upon healthy physiology. And in this case, fertility is not pathology. Why would we truncate it or get rid of it? And then, of course, there are privacy issues. We can talk about that. Their safety has been compromised. There's been over 300 attacks of people in different uh, this is in Toronto, uh, in restrooms and that sort of thing. And it also attacks equality between the sexes. We saw this just last week where the wrestler won a state championship in Texas. Now, if I wrestled and used steroids, I would be disqualified and called a cheater. However, if I used steroids and wrestled and said, well, it's because I think I'm a woman, I could be a champion. This sort of incoherence is problematic for the common good. So what's the answer? The answer is to reaffirm and recast what I would call real reality, a robust anthropology. I'm not going to go into the uh, components of that. I will tease you with it and just simply say by way of closing. In these types of discussions, some positions are often accused of and labeled as being, quote, on the wrong side of history, whatever that bumper sticker means. However, what's really vitally important is not to be on the, quote, wrong side of history or the right side of history, but rather the right side of reality, the right side of the truth. 
That is the best way to promote human flourishing. That's the best way to promote the common good. And that's the model we need now to provide clarity, conviction, and courage. Tell us the inherent design of who we are pre-politically must direct the use of technology and technos. I look forward to our uh, dialogue. Thank you so much. I want to first say thank you. Thank you to Glenna Community College for sponsoring Every Spring Critical Dialogues. Uh, we need this in our culture at this time. So thank you, Peter. Thank you to the other guests on the panel as well. We have different perspectives brought together to talk uh, in a common conversation about that which we differ on. And the views expressed there are not the only ones available. We hope to start a conversation that will actually ripple across the campus and across you know, the days and weeks to come. Let me begin by saying, as many of you have seen me in other panel discussions, you know that I am a Christian, I am a follower of Jesus. And as such, I'm, a committed, to, I'm committed to his view of truth. In a particularly well-known lecture that he gave, actually we in the Christian community call it the Sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke, he used a striking metaphor, and I think it's helpful for our dialogue today. He said this, and pr permit me as a, as a former pastor, one scripture quotation for you. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be compared to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall." Jesus is, of course, making profound claims about his teaching and the centrality of it to one's life. But notice also his view of truth. Number one, that truth exists and can be known. And secondly, truth has consequences. To live in accord with truth brings human flourishing. To live against the grain of truth and reality is actually destructive. I want to remember those points as we, I probe in this issue of transgenderism as it affects people and policies. I think that's a helpful entry point into our, our, uh, our topic today. Our culture is awash with controversy. Dr. Vincella mentioned a number of those I won't mention. I had, I had a few listed in my notes as well, but he delineated them. You know, every week, within the last two weeks, we've seen these kinds of things. You cannot go and see some article popping up talking about these issues in policies or school boards or in the medical community. But underlying these cultural controversies are differing worldview assumptions, and that is crucial to, to, to grasp. The issues of sexuality involve differing conceptions of the human person, and my goal is to examine some of the philosophical underpinnings of those who promote a transgender ideology. I want to make a crucial distinction here that you make, make sure everybody hears between transgendered individuals and transgender ideology. There are those transgendered individuals that, that, that struggle and suffer from gender dysphoria, and we need, they need compassion. They need a listening ear. But transgender ideology is something different altogether. It has to do with ideas and agendas, and that's my focus today. At the heart of ideologies are ideas, as we would expect. And two points about ideas. If you remember my, my two slogans, my two bumper sticker points, ideas never stand alone, and ideas never stand still. Ideas never stand alone. For all of those cultural controversies, the flare-ups in our, our culture on the media, there's always a deep substructure underneath them of philosophical thinking, of reasoning. So they, these ideas that we see in the media, they never stand alone. We need to probe beneath them. But also, ideas never stand still. There are implications and applications in the social, cultural, political, medical, educational realms. Ideas travel someplace. Ideas have trajectory. What do I mean? Ideas never stand alone. The ideas of transgender thought is that the brain can be at war with the body. Now, usually we consider this a disorder to be treated with psychological counseling and therapy. We heard it mentioned by Dr. Benchella a number of these. Body integrity identity disorder is one who identifies as a disabled person and feels trapped in a fully functional body. Perhaps we're most familiar with anorexia nervosa, a persistent mistaken belief that one is obese. Now, in all these cases, and there are others that could be mentioned, therapy is usually the solution and the path to, to, to human flourishing. 
there, to deal with this misalignment of perception and reality. But in the case of gender dysphoria, something has happened in the cultural context. Transgender ideologues do not seek to change the person's feelings of gender identity to match the body, as in these other cases, but rather engage in a process of changing the body through hormones and surgery to match the feelings. And this rests upon two convictions, that there is a decoupling, number one, of sexual identity from the body, that the body, as we heard, is almost disposable, and number two, that an act of will seemingly creates gender reality. I can dictate my ontology, I can dictate the metaphysical reality of who I am. This is indicative of a, of a postmodern view of psychosexual identity, as one author has stated. Transgender ideology rests upon key philosophical concepts that are postmodern and anti realist in nature. That gender is fluid, we hear this often. Transgender activist Judith Butler argues in her book, Gender Trouble. When gender is theorized as radically independent of sex, gender itself becomes a free-floating artifice. It's free-floating until the will directs to where it's going to land. With the consequence, she writes, that man and masculine, the, con the concept of man and masculine might just as easily signify a female body as a male one, and woman and feminine as concepts, male, a male body as easily as a feminine one. Ryan Anderson has recently written, at the heart of the transgender movement are radical ideas about the human person. In particular, that people are what they claim to be regardless of contrary evidence. A transgender boy is a boy, not merely a girl who identifies as a boy. It's understandable why activists make these claims. An argument about transgender identities will be much more persuasive if it concerns who someone is not merely how someone identifies. And so the rhetoric of the transgender movement drips with ontological assertions, philosophical issues. People are the gender they prefer to be, that's the claim. And he goes on to add, at the core of the ideology is the radical claim that feelings determine reality. Feelings determine reality. Now that is a radical philosophical sentiment that ought to be examined and tested. But often we just, it's, just, it's, it's gone over very quickly as we, we deal with the cultural issues on the media. Philosopher Eliot Crozet argues that these claims appear to rest on the postmodern anti-realist assumption that what one takes as reality is mere subjective or socio-cultural construct. And Professor Crozet goes on to give the implications of such a view. If you hold this postmodern view, what follows from this? Hence, there are no objective natures. No human nature, no male nature, no female nature, and no such thing as human flourishing that results from the proper functioning of the essential properties and capacities of a human nature. It is this notion of postmodern truth that underlies the transgender ideology, and it must be noted and examined. The cultural conflicts remind us that ideas never stand alone. There is some deep philosophical substructure to them. But ideas never stand still. There are always implications and applications in the culture, as we've mentioned. Ideas have trajectory. They go someplace. Or as Ryan Anderson says in just a simple sentence, transgender policies follow from transgender ontology, or the nature of being. Some ne I believe that some ne negative implications are flowing from transgendered ideology and its postmodern base. I had a five in my notes. I only have time, I think, to mention two or three. But paradoxically, transgendered ideology actually, number one, hurts and undercuts women's rights. Those who most clamor for women's rights ought to be concerned about the postmodern base in transgendered ideology because it actually hinders, I believe, women's rights. Nancy Piercy states, to protect women's rights, we must be able to say what a woman is. If postmodernism is correct, that the body itself is a social construct, as some of them argue, then it becomes impossible to argue for rights based on the sheer fact of being female. We cannot legally protect a category of people if we cannot identify that category. Now before someone says, oh, that's just pure philosophical abstraction, that's a slippery slope argument, that's where you think we could go. No, these are real things that are in our court systems today, at least in court systems around the world. Ashley McGuire in her book, Sex Scandal, The Drive to Abolish Male and Female, speaks of the unintended consequences for women of transgendered ideology. And she mentions the court case, Kimberly versus Vancouver Rape Relief Society, where the Relief Society, this crisis center for women that had been raped, had to deal with, they were, they were, they were men, biological men, that wanted to, to self-present as a woman and be part of the, the, the rape center. And this obviously triggered women to say, no, we don't want biological males in a place where we're supposed to be a place of safety. 
And they actually had to go to court to, to decide this. Kathleen Sloan, a prominent liberal feminist and pro-choice activist, I mention that because she's probably on the opposite spectrum of me politically in many ways. She argues the threat that the gender identity movement poses to women is that gender is detached from biological differences between males and females, which is present in all mammalian species. And consequently, male supremacy and the oppression of women is obscured and ultimately erased. So it hurts women's rights, I believe this, this, this philosophical base of postmodernism in the transgender movement. It also undercuts, secondly, human rights in general. Remember Professor Crozat's argument about, it, about, about the postmodern nature of the, the base. No objective natures, no human natures, no male nature, no female nature. But this postmodern view is at odds with the concepts of rights in general. He writes, if the concept of natural human rights is sensible, then reality is not a mere construct. There must be something objectively real and valuable to serve as the basis of these rights. Objective rights do not exist on the postmodernist worldview, regardless of how vigorously one believes in them. For a postmodernist to believe in objective rights is like believing in centaurs, the character of Greek mythologies that are, that are half man and half horse. One can believe in them, but, in do, but doing so makes no significant difference in the world. Consequently, the supporter of transgenderism cannot deny human nature and rights, but at the same time assert the right to define himself or to use a preferred restroom. Nor can, he, nor can he legitimately claim that his rights are violated by gender dichotomists' policies. To do this is, is intellectually inconsistent. There is a deep internal contradiction between transgendered philosophical presuppositions and the quest for rationally grounded human rights. That ought to concern all of us. And lastly, for purposes of our, our, my discussion here, transgendered ideology, I believe, hurts children, the most vulnerable in our society. It harms children by legitimizing unhealthy medical procedures and penalizing alternatives that recognize the reality of what's called gender desistance. Those who will actually feel a sense of gender dys dysphoria for a season and then come out of that. Transgendered activists' plan of action when they have a child that experiences uh, gender dysphoria, and they, and they believe they can recognize it as in ages five, four, three, and some have even said perhaps even two years old, as if a two-year-old can make that kind of significant life decision. But the form of treatment is number one, fourfold. Number one, social transition at the earliest age possible by portraying and uh, treating the, 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 new, the child with new clothes, a new name, and new pronouns in terms of what they're experiencing. As they approach puberty, the second uh, issue they deal with is do is puberty blockers that begin to block the natural onset of puberty and the hormones that are released. Thirdly, around the age 16, cross-sex hormones are given. And if this is continued, these will be necessary for the rest of one's life and around age 18, or perhaps after, sex reassignment surgery. Those ages, by the way, are getting lower and lower. In England, there's a doctor that's prescribing cross-sex hormones at third stage at, 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 with children as young as 12. And Ryan Anderson says, there are no laws in the United States prohibiting the use of puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones for children or regulating the age at which they may, may be administered. These medical practices are not driven by science but by a post-modernist ideology. Dr. Michelle Cretella, board-certified pediatrician and president of the American College of Pediatrician, writes in the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons in 2016, to be clear, this alternative perspective of an innate gender fluidity arising from prenatally feminized or masculinized brains trapped in the wrong body is an ideological belief that has no basis in rigorous science. What is, what is known? What are the facts of the matter that we, we do have? What does the evidence show? There is the fact of gender desistance among children as they move into late adolescence. Dr. Cretella again says, experts on both sides of the puberty suppression debate agree that within this context, here this figure, 80% to 95% of children with gender dysphoria accepted their biological sex and achieved emotional well-being by late adolescence. There's the fact of the side effects of puberty blocking hormone therapies, some that are known and some that are unknown. There's not been any long-term uh, uh, testing on, on what happens when you do this to children on the long term. There's the fact of the self-fulfilling nature of transgender activist protocols for puberty suppression. In a follow-up study, Cretello writes, 70 eligible candidates to receive puberty suppression, the doctor DeVries and his colleagues documented that all subjects, all 70, went on to embrace a transgender identity and request cross-sex hormones. She writes, this is cause for concern. 
There is an obvious self-fulfilling nature to encourage a young man with gender dysphoria to socially impersonate a girl and then institute puberty suppression. Given the well-established phenomenon of neuroplasticity, the repeated behavior of impersonating a girl alters the structure and function of the boy's brain in some way, potentially in a way that will make identity alignment with his biologic sex less likely. Think about that. Under normal conditions, 80 and 95% of children with gender dysphoria will, will have a desistance that will, they will, that will be resolved in a healthy way. Those that are put on and said, no, we're going to treat you in this manner as if your gender dysphoria is you're really who you are, all of them in that study, all 70 went on. Not one said, I, I don't want to go back to what I felt was my original uh, gender. Transgendered ideology subse subjects children to experimentation with lifelong consequences. Cortella writes again, Dr. Cortella, the, the treatment of gender dysphoria in childhood with hormones effectively amounts to mass experimentation on and sterilization of youth who are cognitively incapable of providing informed consents. Surely even those among us in this room who will differ on the issues of transgenderism and some of the philo philosophical issues could agree and come to a common cause and agreement about the dangers of transgender ideology for children, those most weakest in our society. What have I attempted to argue? Debates we see in the media and the realms and the culture have deeper philosophical issues undergirding them. Ideas never stand alone and they never stand still. In particular, transgender activists are pursuing the implementation of their ideology, are working with a postmodernist view of reality in the human person. An act of the will determines reality. There's not an essential human nature. Rather, we create ourselves and our gender. I mentioned the philosophical commitment. This philosophical commitment has problems and has dangerous implications for women's rights, human rights, children's uh, medical and psychological well-being. We need to wrestle with the underlying philosophical issues. Don't treat the cultural conflicts that you see in the news or on your Twitter feed or on Facebook as simply something to be decided by mere feeling. Do I like that or not like that? Think about the implication and application of these philosophical ideas that undergird the decisions that are being made. Dehumanizing philosophies will lead to dehumanizing practices in education, law, medicine, and culture at large. To circle back to where I began, Jesus taught that truth exists and can be known and that truth has consequences. To live in accord with truth brings human flourishing and to live against the grain of truth and reality is ultimately destructive and I would urge us all to listen to him. Thank you. I believe Peter and I have been assigned the opposite point of view. Uh, I do agree with uh, a couple of things that uh, we're not quite sure what is normal. I'm not sure what normal is. I've been teaching a long time. I have taught people who are now, well, that I now have to think of as she instead of he. So I know people who are trans, and I'm comfortable with that. I do not see that women's rights are being affected just because we have a trans culture. I'd rather have human rights. I think human rights are better than just male or female rights. I am a great believer in equality, no matter where you find it. The practice of medicine at one time did not need much in the way of ethical analysis. There wasn't a lot that medicine could do to help a person become whole. Slowly, medicine collected more and more procedures that could really aid people. Recently, Beauchamp and Childress formalized some of the principles that we are now using primarily in biomedical ethics. You know, the principle of don't doing any harm, doing good, principles of justice, and of course, autonomy. The only way that we can really learn to respect each other 
is to reverence that autonomy that makes us who we are. Now, the development of medical technology, I will admit, has gone faster than the formal development of ethics. At this point, unless we are held back by some thought patterns that refuse to recognize that we have grown beyond the exercise of tyrannical powers over others, a large number of us have come to reverence and accept the autonomy of each person. Medical ethics today is generally willing to accept that each individual person has the ultimate say over the configuration of their body. Individual autonomy has become the major guiding principle in medical ethics. Now this configuration of our bodies has been challenged that, oh, you're taking away healthy parts of a body. And we shouldn't do that. Uh, at my age, I have known many men who've decided their um, healthy reproductive uh, actions need to be limited by a vasectomy, which is clearly altering a healthy part of their body. It's used for birth control. They have decided in their autonomy that they have enough children. And in order to be a whole, complete parent and a good husband, they don't want to produce anymore. We have other kinds of things that people will engage in, and medical science can now help. People are born with various types of deformities. We can now help many of those. Not all. We have a way to go, and we don't know what limits we ought to use as yet. But notice I am speaking of those with autonomy, those who are capable of making a decision on their own. Those who I have known who are now trans waited until they were older. One of those was a student here and probably the best philosophy student that we have ever had. She is tremendous, still a good philosopher, and much better looking than I am. Now, uh, the concept of autonomy is the basis of informed consent. Without consent, no one is supposed to be able to touch the body of another person. This idea is not limited to medical ethics. It has affected our political discourse as well in the Me Too movement. The violation of autonomy is a criminal act. So if we are treating people without consent, that should be a criminal act. We are touching their bodies. I am not authorized to touch anyone without their consent. Autonomy includes the idea that each person is able to decide who they are. No one, whether in society, government, church, or whatever, should be able to define who a person is and how they see themselves. This idea, of course, means that each of us must respect the autonomy of everyone else. None of us should disrespect another person and their choices, at least not intentionally, because we are limited in our understanding of both ourselves and each other. There will be times when we will inadvertently exhibit disrespect. 
There, are, there will be times when we will say things that are put downs of another's culture. Even when we do not mean it, we don't mean to be insulting. I make certain that I apologize to my classes on a somewhat regular basis because in teaching philosophy, I'm going to challenge every idea I can locate that the students might have. In challenging ideas, I may inadvertently insult them. I don't mean to insult, I mean to challenge. There are those within our society who do not respect the, autonomies, the autonomy of others and wish to impose their value systems and lifestyles on everyone else. This is a power play. Frederick Nietzsche would be pl very proud of many of them. It is a refusal to grow and to share an understanding of the various points of view that are available to us. It is only through a sharing of a diversity of views that like Socrates, we can come closer to the truth. We do not have all of the truth. We are discovering the truth. Whether we are looking at the formation of the universe or the expression of the universe in each individual person, it is becoming more and more obvious that a bifurcated world does not reflect the world as it is. We are on graduated scales of various expressions. This graduated scale includes our concepts of sexuality and gender. None of us are totally male or female. We each possess characteristics that have been labeled male or female. The label is somewhat arbitrary. And as with all labels, we try to live according to our arbitrary label. In ethics, a term, uh, uh, a theory termed feminist ethics has been developed. Some have even tried to rename it care ethics so that men could use it as well. Basically, it is an ethic based on caring and the development of the, this position as feminist ethics seems to imply that men are incapable of caring. That's nonsense. That's part of, part of our bifurcation. I don't know about you, but I've known many men quite capable of caring. I also have looked at history. We have men, good examples of men who are capable of caring. It's not just a woman's thing. We should recognize that we are flowing as a people, as a gender in our identity. The labels, they're interesting and they do affect our behavior. I'm assuming that most of you know someone who is not comfortable in the body in which they live. Somehow that label of whatever that body is, is in Congress with the person's own feelings about themselves. They just don't identify with what they see in the mirror. They wish to bring about some harmony between that self-image and the image that is presented by their bodies. Because of advances in medical technology, we can bring about some harmony. The level of harmony that each person needs will differ. Some need drastic surgery, some just need a change of clothing. We have to recognize and accept how each person sees themselves without that justification 
of that bifurcated world that is presented to us so often. Bifurcation doesn't work. We can um, look at science and even one of the things that I've been most fascinated by, and I can't find it in my notes now, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, some of you are familiar with him, good physicist, describes in one of his books, in fact, a little one that anybody can read, even me, on physics, talks about the unity that we have in our world. We all started from a speck, less smaller than the dot at the end of some of my paragraphs or sentences. And the first thing that was there apparently was light. Those photons that formed eventually formed all of us. Tyson calls all of us kind of little bits and pieces of stars. We're really all the same thing expressing itself in slightly different ways. But there is a basic unity between all of us. Some cultures have accepted that unity. Ours has not. Quite as much. We're beginning to. I do not know how much of that unity that we will ever be able to hang on to. When I'm teaching biomedical ethics, excuse me, environmental ethics, I try to show students Tyson's view of the universe so that all of us will reverence not just each other, but the world around us as well. We are really one. We don't need the bifurcated labels. We need to accept those who are not comfortable in the bifurcated world. We need to get rid of some of our definitions of what a man needs to do to be a man, what a woman needs to do to be a woman, and try and figure out what it needs to be a person or a part of this creation that began 14 billion years ago? Remember. You remember. I'm beginning to feel like I remember. We are learning so much about our universe through science that one of the biggest faults I see between science and philosophy right now is our neglect of working together. We're going to have to look at what medical science has to offer in its technology and what the rest of science has to offer. Science and philosophy need to go together and develop an ethic that will respect each human with their own identity and each element within our universe. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. So uh, after I'm done, and I'll try to be done as quickly as I can, please line up and ask questions at that microphone. Um, we encourage questions, particularly from students, but everybody is, in, is invited to ask questions. So I'm going to first begin with just a few general comments about uh, the speakers um, and what they said. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Ventera uh, complained that uh, due to this trend of gen uh, transgenderism, or trans, uh, the law has to start making metaphysical or ontological decisions. Well, the law has been making the metaphysical and ontological decisions for a very long time. 
like recently, for example, 2010, in Citizens United, the Supreme Court made the decision, it's a metaphysical decision, that corporations are persons. Now, whether you agree with that or not, right now is not the issue. The issue is that that was a metaphysical decision. So the law makes all the time all kinds of metaphysical and ontological decisions about the nature of reality, in this case, that corporations are the kind of entities that are, have the characteristics of persons. So that's an ontological decision. Secondly, I just wanted to mention or comment a little bit about the horrors that uh, both uh, Dr. Ventrella and my friend Richard mentioned regarding the transgenderism or what I call and beyond. Um, anybody who knows a little bit history knows that every revolution is an experiment. When humans engage in a revolution or a change, even in evolution, it's an experiment. And it changes the structure. Inevitably, there will be certain tensions. There will be a range of cases where people don't know how to resolve. They will be struggling how to resolve those cases. We do not have an automatic template. Just because we decided to change things in this way, now there's some sort of like a divine uh, printer that prints out, okay, this is how you're gonna decide this case and this is how you're gonna decide this case. There's a lot of unknowns that have to be reconsidered. And uh, Richard is absolutely right. Ideas move, exactly. And it takes time before we realize the ramifications of ideas. We settle on those. So there is always rambling. When there's an earthquake, usually there are rumblings. Well, those are the ramblings. So this is human experimentation. And when humanity discovered that we are standing on a rock that floats in space, that required some adjustment. It wasn't that easy. In fact, one of the major debaters in the so-called many worlds view at the time said that if that view is correct, he'd rather commit suicide. It's very scary to stand on a rock floating in space. I mean, if it's a sphere, why you don't fall down? So it takes time. So all of these horror stories are just part of what, it, what happens when any revolution happens. And if you look at history, you will find that. Nobody knew how we're gonna develop, for example, if we abolish slavery or give women the right to vote. How are we gonna do that? Or say, okay, you guys, you can now go out there and earn some money. You don't have to be at home. It creates a lot of problems. Now, some of those we can anticipate and perhaps correct, some of those but we can't. So a lot of the horror stories that were mentioned are part of the practical, legal, political, social implications of a change, a change that we are not accustomed to, the structures that are currently present are not there to tell us okay, how do we deal with this? And every change of that kind, as I said, has these implications. So we shouldn't be sort of taken aback. Wow, these things are happening. Yeah, they always happen whenever there is drastic change. That's just part of it. Um, now, both Oh, before I go any further, let me just say this. I am not a postmodernist, period. I believe there is objective truth.
but I also believe that most of it is there rather than there. It's ahead, not back there. And both Dr. Ventura and, and Richard make the assumption that a lot of the truths are already there and we know. I don't think so. I don't think that 2,500 years ago we knew that there are billions of galaxies. I don't think we knew that. So we stand here today and much of what is true is still ahead. And we have a lot to investigate and find out. And we always have to balance out what we think was discovered already and what may turn out to be false. History shows that much of what we thought that we know for certain turned out to be false. And so I don't think that supporting the movements such as gay relationships, gay marriage, transgenderism requires us to make assumptions such as that, for example, there is no objective truth about anything. It's just that maybe we don't know what the truth is. And maybe when it comes to humans, those truths are even more elusive. And so the difference is not either you are a postmodernist and the underlying ideology and philosophy of this sexual revolution that actually has many phases. Transgenderism is just the latest one, so far as I know. There may be out there already way ahead some others, but so far as I know, uh, but it's, I think that it's all a process of discovery and it's not an easy one. So it's not postmodernism or objective truth, which we already know. There is something in between those. And that is, there is objective truth, but we may not know what it is. And when we don't know, then we have to keep an open mind. People didn't know that there was this huge continent, which we are now part of, in between Europe and India. Who knows how many people died on the way and, and all kinds of suffering that happened on the way. But they didn't know. So discovery very often requires sacrifices. And sometimes you go in the wrong direction. So once again, I want to completely reject the premise that transgenderism requires the ideology of postmodernism. It doesn't. But what does it require then? And now I'm going to turn a little bit to what I have to say. Richard, uh, somebody's pen? Richard sort of pointed to the elephant in the room. So I'm going to just call its name. The issue behind us or in front of us with the case of transgenderism is the, this, the contrast between God's authority and human autonomy. That is what is at issue. And God's authority can be manifested in two different ways. I hope you excuse me, Richard, that I don't call God Jesus. I... We'll forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I already talked. God's authority can be manifested according to this view in two different ways. One is the way, one way in which Richard uh, described, 
quoting from the Bible. The Bible is revelation, and so therefore, the Bible reveals God's authority and the truth. The other way is God's authority is written into natural law. So we, with reason, can discover that law and know what is the right thing to do. How is the right way of organizing society? How is the right way to conduct ourselves? And so forth and so on. Now, both Richard and uh, Dr. Ventura did appeal to both of these ways in which God's authority is manifested. And all we have to do is just recognize that authority written either in the Bible or in nature, and then draw the consequences and follow them. Departing from these things will have lead to disaster. Now, I think that there is a lot of issues with reading Revelation out of biblical stories, and I won't go into that because it's way too complicated. I essentially disagree with almost every interpretation of the, from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament that I know that Richard and Dr. Ventrella will accept. I will mention one very important one that drives almost everything else. I absolutely reject the interpretation of the Adam and Eve story in the Old Testament in terms of the original sin and the fall. That story has nothing to do with original sin and exactly the opposite than the fall, but I won't go into it. There are lots of problems with the manner in which these biblical narratives are interpreted, and very often so those interpretation leads us in the wrong direction. Incidentally, I discovered just in the last few days that there is a very interesting debate between within the evangelical community, between a majority and a minority, and there is a certain minority that actually maintain that neither the Old Testament nor the New Testament should be interpreted as being against uh, same-sex partnerships. So there is an interesting debate uh, about that. Um, so you can see that there is a lot of questions about interpretation of biblical narrative. What about the laws of nature? Well, just like the laws of nature in physics, chemistry, biology, and every other science which deals with the laws of nature, we can see that it takes a long time to read what are the laws of nature. We changed our views about just astronomy several times. We're stuck now in science between quantum mechanics and relativity, and we're looking for some unifying theory, and who knows what that will look like. So the laws of nature are not, some, are not something that we can say we know what they are. And there's no reason to believe that the same doesn't hold for humans, what human nature is. Aristotle thought that there is such a thing as human nature, namely what he called Slavic nature. People are by their nature determined to be slaves. He also thought that human nature requires women to be the sort of in the province of the private and men in the province of the public. And that was by nature. So we change these things through experimentation with very painful, often very painful consequences. We are still sometimes struggling with those consequences. When women now can go out, half of the audience here, maybe more than half, are women. 100 years ago, it would have been unheard of, maybe two. 
We still struggle with those, as we can see from the very kind of examples that uh, Dr. Ventrera and Richard alluded to. We don't know how to deal yet with these things. There are a lot of problems that I agree with. Like, for example, there are very often uh, families in which children are basically raised by one parent or maybe no parent. So we don't know how to deal with these things. But that doesn't mean that what we did is wrong or it's against human nature in some way. What it means is that we have not found solutions to the changes we undertaken. So I reject the idea that somehow we can read out of nature conclusions that are clear and obvious that everybody should immediately bow to. The truth is, much of the truth is still ahead, not in our backs. Now I want to talk a little bit about the other side, human autonomy. Autonomy is essentially self-governance. And what is self-governance? Self-governance is when we devise the principles and the laws on the basis of which we conduct ourselves. And we hope that our conduct will test those laws and see, we can then see whether they are the right ones or the wrong ones. And on the way, we can, of course, change if it turns out that there is too much conflict between the practical consequences, the conduct, and the laws we devised. But it's very important that we do this process based on an autonomous decision making. Autonomy is the product of the enlightenment. And it being the center stage of human conduct gave us everything essentially that we right now produced, all the knowledge, all the technology, is because of the concept of autonomy that took hold in different human affairs, in politics, in science, even in religion. The whole reformation was based essentially on the idea that the relation between each human being and God is an autonomous relationship and doesn't have to be mediated by some central authority of the church. So now let's go to the cases of transgenderism. A lot was said about the fact that transgender, transgenderism is some sort of like a capricious sort of decision of identity based on some fleeting feelings or whatever. I don't see it that way. The way I see it is that transgenderism or a person that is pondering, feeling, experiencing perhaps a certain kind of conflict between their identity and their physical, biological, Uh, character is too an experiment, an experiment and a process to discover the truth. Who am I? It's not simple. Who am I? It may be itself a process of discovery. And yes, there may be casualties. All new discoveries have casual casualties. That goes without saying. That's the nature of the search for knowledge, there are casualties, always. And it's a very tragic thing that there should be casualties, but we have to accept that once we realize we are not omniscient, knowledge has a cost. The search for knowledge has a cost. So I take transgenderism to be an exploration of identity, gender identity. 
is it fixed? Is it determined biologically? Or is it rather a mental choice? And incidentally, I find it astonishing that actually people who are more predisposed to make a distinction between the physical and the mental would actually argue that a choice about my identity, a choice, a choice, a decision, a process of mental engagement is actually determined by a biological thing. I would have thought that who am I is a mental thing. I think Descartes said that already some, somewhere. I think therefore I am, which essentially means that we are first and foremost mental beings. So the point which I'm making is that like every other search for knowledge, this one too is a mental process. And I don't see why should we assume that the answer should be dictated by some pre-existing biological fact. They may be, but then again, maybe they are not. So, uh, is there a problem about transgenderism? Yeah, there is a problem. We don't know the answer whether transgenderism is actually a new form of identity or not. But that's the problem to be, the, to be discovered, not to be predetermined ahead of time. Are there boundaries? My title says, is there a problem about transgenderism and beyond? Yes, I do find boundaries. What could they be? Well, I simply do not believe that a conscious person with a complex psychology and mental life we are can actually identify themselves as a water bottle. I don't think that's possible. Why? Because if we talk about my, our identity as a mental being, then we have to identify as a mental being. We can't simply identify as some inanimate object that has no mental life. So, no, I don't think we can identify as a water bottle. I don't even think that we can identify really as a, like a cat. Why? Because part of the process of being identi identifying, finding your identity is cognitive processes. So if we identify with something, we have to identify with something that has a cognitive process that is at least similar. But notice all the criteria I'm giving now are criteria that have to do with the mental not necessarily with the fact that we are physical beings. It's all about the fact that water bottles are not conscious things, therefore we can't identify with them, and that cats are not cognitive beings. If they turn out to have a complex cognitive thing, then who knows? But for now, I would draw the boundary right there. But somebody who was born as a male identifying as a female well, for now, I don't see a problem with that. Thank you. <laughs> question. Please uh, line up there for questions. Dare to ask. Uh, I had a question for Ventrella. Uh, my quick question was, uh, a lot of your arguments were based on the fact that transgendered people uh, don't really have uh, the mental psych 
psychology or the mental capacity to make decisions for themselves. Do you have any arguments that would uh, continue and support your theory if someone could prove that a transgender person is of sane mind and body? Because I know about 20, 40, probably low ball in it, but like 60 years ago when women would say, hey, I'd like to vote and get a job, they would give them a lobotomy because they were not of sane mind. So how is your thinking not similar in that process? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, a, couple of, a couple of points there. Let's just remember that it was the men that ratified the Constitution for suffrage. Thankfully, thankfully that happened. Of course, that was a horrible thing and I never would have supported that myself. Uh, as to uh, people who have undergone those surgeries, I happen to know a number of them. Um, and some of them have detransitioned, okay? So what we have to look at, all we have is history. That's why my point of history is not completely irrelevant here. And the, for example, uh, sadly, the suicide rate who people who have transitioned is about 40 times higher than the general population. That ought to be a flag and not merely written off as, well, it's a casualty of revolution. Uh, we can't be as flippant at that when people are dying in those kinds of situations. Uh, my point was, in dealing with capacity and consent issues, was focusing on the children. Um, at some point, one of the professors talked about, well, it's all about autonomy. Autonomy is the lodestone. Autonomy is the touchstone. Okay, when does that become viable? When does autonomy come into existence, assuming that it applies? When is it diminished? How are we to make these kinds of decisions? And so, it's not the question of, can people make a choice? The question is, does the choice govern all other disciplines and can it be coerced as to others? That, I think, is the bigger societal kinds of issue. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, what did I miss? What did I miss? My, my simply point is we can't pigeonhole people's policy or politics simply by some type of identity politics. It's important to remember that if we're going to dialogue critically about that. That was the point. Okay, what did I miss? Could you repeat it so that uh, we can be clear? Do you have any arguments based on the idea that a trans person is acting within a sane mind? Within what kind of mind? A sane mind. Well, it's, one can be sane and make mistakes. One can be sane and do evil acts. I mean, there's a whole spectrum there. Sanity is not the touchstone here. It's one component. I we think what you seem to be saying is uh, that a person who is act acting on surgery is someone who is of non-sane mind. Oh, no, no, no. What I quoted was Dr. Paul McHugh at Johns Hopkins, and his words were that there was a collaboration with madness, that when there was, in fact, gender dysphoria or bodily integrity disorder, BID, that his expert opinion as a psychiatrist, chief of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins was, this was, and this is a popular article, not a journal article, he's written many of them, uh, was collaborating with madness. He's obviously speaking generally. He's not, he's not using it transitively, saying every each in person doing it. But he did a number of longitudinal studies, and that's why he concluded in 1979 to stop this, because it was collaborating with madness. You can look up the popular article I quote. It's called Sexual Surgery, November 2004. And he's written before that. I know we, we can't look behind all the time, but uh, we ought to look at what he wrote, and we can look up to this point when he's doing it. That's what I, I quoted. I didn't say that. I was saying, for example, there's some freshness here. Hello. I want to start by saying my name is Elizabeth Heath. <clears throat> I actually have no personal bias on this ish, um, topic, not issue, um, topic, and I think you guys all made great points. However, my question is for Peter Lupu. That's how you say it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so 
your argument was on the basis that we don't know what's ahead, so we can't really dictate um, what's right or what's incorrect um, as far as this topic goes. My question actually is um, how much of this research and whatnot do we take uh, with all these casualties and all of these um, deformities and all these issues um, as we've as was stated before, before we decide that this is not revolutionary, before we um, hit a boundary where we're like, okay, this was not the intent, it, it didn't work out. The, the, this idea did not work out. Oh, this works actually. Does it work? I guess it works. Uh, good question. And my answer is I don't know. Uh, if you look at history, you'll find that uh, new movements, you know, uh, uh, take a long time. Some take longer than others, with quite a lot of sacrifices to uh, mature. And then, particularly when it comes to human affairs, uh, it comes. It 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 takes a lot to figure out how things will work. Um, Take, for example, the wonderful revolution, uh, you know, the French Revolution, uh, which was, of course, a revolution that um, was supposed to seal the, the, the great uh, ideas of the Enlightenment and the social contract and so forth and so on. Well, the French Revolution cost hundreds of thousands of lives hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, even here in our country, uh, its history shows that certain processes take a long time. Uh, medicine, take simple medicine. Very frequently, a new discovery, of course it has to go through different approval processes, but even then, there may be uh, some, uh, you know, uh, terrible cases where it doesn't work before we discover, okay, this is, this medication or this procedure is worth having despite the fact that there are some high percentage or some percentage of cases that doesn't work out versus some other. There, it's not easy to decide ahead of time. What we can do is try to anticipate as much as we can. As I say, I want to be clear, I believe that the, the, the search for knowledge, there is, a, there is some method that drives it, but in practice it's very messy. So we should not be expecting that things will come very soon or we can count how many cases. We may eventually discover that transgenderism is actually something that can be stabilized, that people feel happier, and so forth, or when we may discover that it isn't. We don't know. All I'm saying is let's not decide that the truth is already known in the past, so. Well, one of the things I'd kind of like to add is that in order to get um, surgery, you have to uh, be diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. So part of the way we have our system set up now is to make certain that everybody who really wants the surgery must be declared a nutcase uh, in order to be able to get the surgery. What we need to do is to look carefully at the procedures that we are using in order to allow people to get this, the help that they need, whatever that help may be. We have classified all kinds of, I, at one time I was, I would have been up for the death penalty. I'm left-handed. Now I do know that uh, as late as my father, he was changed to being right-handed, so he would be normal. Fortunately, I came along at a time when left-handedness 
it's still unusual, but it is not totally abnormal. I don't need treatment. Eventually, although I think I'm still classified as a sexual deviant in one of our books, I'm a celibate. Celibacy is classified by some people as sexual deviancy, uh, which I always find interesting when our government is trying to promote abstinence to our um, children. I guess they're trying to get, turn them all into sexual deviants, into celibates. Uh, you know, let's get real, people. We do need to look at how we are classifying people, what is needed in order to be able to get people the proper treatment, and maybe we have to change some of our procedures. Yeah, I'll agree with these gentlemen right now that, hey, these trans people, they're all nutcases. If they want to get the kind of help they need, they're going to have to get classified that way. Uh, that is what our medical establishment now requires. So we do need to look at some of this. I've got this out of, uh, let's see, it's called uh, Sex, Lies, and Surgery, the Ethics of Gen Gender Reassignment Surgery. Um, re readily online article. A lot of this stuff is readily online. So it's easy to do the, the, um, you know, your, the research on this. Yes, we do have problems, and we've got a long way to grow. Obviously, we have differences of, a, of perspective on this issue, and um, I had hoped it wouldn't devolve into this where, you know, um, and neither Dr. Ventrell and I never use the, the phrase nutcases. And so to label our views as, well, th these gentlemen, you have to be labeled a nutcase to be helped, um, that's not helpful for critical dialogue. So a little bit of, cri little bit of criticism in our dialogue about how we might want to refer to each other. I would just want to ask, you know, we can point to things in the past that we recognize now are not psychiatric disorders, but that, does that mean there are no psychiatric disorders today? Yeah, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. Well, the fact of the matter, the fact that people at one time were seen as that you shouldn't have to use your left hand, we can say, okay, we, we recognize that that's an incorrect thing. But we're talking about doing major reconstructive surgery on healthy bodies. That's a different kind of thing. And I would, just, I would just note, for, for example, you know, the way Peter described the body. This is, I think this is, this is intriguing you know, in, in his presentation. Let me see if I can get my... He referred to it as, I'm sorry, I'm, a biological thing. He referred to it as pre-existing biological facts. We, we are first and foremost mental creatures. In, this is, this is a, there's an irony here because in the, the history of, the, of Christian theology, there has been an element of, of Platonism that has denigrated the body, and inappropriately so, and that we've talked a lot about heaven and not about the new earth and not about you know, that which God created in terms of you know, matter, that matter matters and, it, and God likes it. And, but now to have to be here as a Christian reminding my friend here that you know, the body matters. It's not simply an appendage, a thing. It's part of, of, of who we are. It's a dynamic of who we are. And so it's not simply, it's not, I don't believe it's just pri the primacy of the mental. I think that when I'm talking to uh, atheistic, reductionistic people like, you know, materialists, which is what like Neil uh, de Tyson, uh, Tyson was that was mentioned earlier, you know, we, ha we have to talk about there is a consciousness. There is a hard problem of consciousness. There is a spirit or a soul or a mind. But here I'm having to remind ourselves, no, the body is a crucial component of who we are. And we ought not to think of it, even the way we begin to speak of it is something we just slough off or cut off. And I think that, that's something to remember. Richard, I, I didn't intend to say that the body is, uh, you know, uh, equivalent to something like hair. I can cut my hair any way I want. Is this working here? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what I meant to say. I think you turned it off. <laughs> it's not now. <laughs> No. 
All right. So what I meant to say is that neither one has a priority over what is our identity as a whole. Uh, and that's the point. Uh, in some cases, yes, there is a priority. The body has a priority. In some cases, no, it doesn't. But we have to, we can't just decide just because the body is part of us, therefore uh, it, it is the determining factor about who our identity is, which I take to be heavily a cognitive psychological issue, which of course has some, the body has something to say about that, but not a veto power. That's, that's what's my point. But I think that Okay, I just had a couple yes or no questions that I wanted to ask before I went to my full question. Uh, so would you consider your mind as part of yourself? Is that not a part of you? He, he that. To both of you over there. I prefer true and false questions, not yes oh, and no okay. ones. But Sorry. No, it's all right. Um, I, I think we have to be careful with facultative psychology that tries to divide up the human person. I believe that the human person is a unified, that has corporeal and non-corporeal things that are joined together. And we ought not to bifurcate, we can distinguish and identify, we ought not to disintegrate. So I guess that's an answer to your question, but I want to be careful you're not pigeonholing. Oh yeah, you're fine. Okay. I just mean it in the general term. I would consider my mind as part of myself. And although you didn't say nut job, you did say madness. And even I if quoted you were, Paul McKee. Yeah, you were, you were quoting somebody, but you're saying this to a group of people. Therefore, you strongly believe that it's a part of, it's a, it's a madness. So in respect to your mind being a part of yourself, if you have cancer, you're going to correct it. Mental illness is, is extremely difficult, but it's a, something that needs to be helped. And uh, trans people, they don't, it's not something wrong with them, but it, because of societal expectations, it becomes depressing. So in respect to madness, what kind of madness were you referring to? Well, Dr. McHugh was referring to this, this disjoint, this disjunction between one's self-perception and the reality of who they were created to be. And the, this disjoinder creates the problem and the tension. And rather, his idea is exactly what you said. We need to treat and help people align, not create further disjunction further disintegration, we have to say that the body tells us something about who we are, not that it's irrelevant completely. And that's where we get to this Gnostic or Neoplatonic sort of tension that's underneath a lot of this debate. Everyone, I think, that, that is good intentioned, and certainly all the Christians I know, want the best to promote human flourishing, including the integrity and flourishing of individual people that are struggling with these kinds of issues. What we're dealing with here is what's the solution and what I was suggesting in raising the questions was the solutions that are being proposed right now driven by gender etiology are solutions that have implications for law and policies that don't promote the common good that are coercive and causing people like for example this notion in some of these uh, university universities and in some places now where you can be fined criminally for not using someone's preferred personal pronoun. Now wait a minute, you know, if I view language as that which is designed to convey truth and not to utter nonsense or lies, that's my conviction. Well, it's one thing to say, I'm gonna refer myself by a different sex. It's quite another to coerce everyone else, the other, to do that. And I'm suggesting that those kinds of ideological moves are problematic. They're also problematic in the medical realm, as I in indicated, and so on and so forth. So everyone wants a solution. Everyone wants a solution that's uh, not coercive. And I want to suggest that what's being proposed now is problematic that, as our topic is, does not promote the common good, nor can it. I think, I think we're talking about a paradigm shift that's here. It's very interesting that uh, June Singer, years ago, said that androgyny, that is to say the obliteration of sexual distinctions, is the sacrament of monism. That it in fact is, I like the word revolution, it's a huge paradigm shift. We need to ask the question, is that a good thing? You mentioned malignancies and cancers, and I have some experience with that in family and so forth. Well, malignancies change. That's the ideology of a cancer cell. Doesn't mean the change is good. It means it needs to be arrested and dealt with. 
Well, by analogy, I'm not saying the people that have these dysphorias are, you know, diseased like cancer or malignant, but I am saying we ought not just applaud change for change's sake. That is an unthinking, uncritical Hegelian notion that we ought to question. But isn't it good to change? Like, it can be, but it's like saying I've got, I took a test and I got all the right answers, but I'm going to change all my answers, get the wrong answers because change is good. But I mean, sometimes that's a silly change example. is necessary. Exactly. Oh, I can get worse, I assure you. But, but the thing is, change is necessary in order to progress as a society. I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by that. We'd have to talk about what you oh, mean so, by that. Uh, Peter Lepou's uh, example of the French Revolution, for example, they thought that that was okay. Uh, the monarchies and everything, they thought it was a good thing. Well, how did Edmund Burke feel about that? Uh, sorry, I I'm not too familiar with that. He utterly critiqued it, and rightly so. Exactly. It was and a disaster. So, it, you need to, exactly, so, but they thought it was, a, a, it, the common idea was So autonomy okay. didn't carry the day. <laughs> there, there, there you go. But the thing is, it changed because it needed to be changed, even though it was perceived as okay. Sometimes it could be perfect, and it's a little bit more change is fine. No one's arguing to be a Luddite, saying there isn't development, that there isn't new knowledge, that we're uh, not technologically, but we need to understand that it has to be rooted in reality. Change for change's sake, is, is, not a, is not an ethical uh, principle. It doesn't mean it, anything. Yeah. Change from what to what, that's the question we have to ask. Right, and, and I think that, uh, and excuse me for a moment of for, course. first of all, I agree, and I wanna announce that every change has a cost. Whether it's good, bad, or in, change has a cost, always. If it's progressive and it's good, it still has a cost. And the question is who bears the cost? That's number one. But what I want to say is my, my whole point is that when we say that change has to conform to reality, I agree with that. The only problem is we don't know what the reality is in some cases. We just don't know. So. You see, the debate here is not about the fact that we can use the word reality to say, well, your change has to conform to reality. You, know? you can't simply think that you're gonna create a machine that does not consume any energy but produces it. You can't do it because we now know, at least, at least at the present time we know, that that would violate the laws of physics. So that's, that's a reality that is there, we know, and we say, okay, you can't do it. But where there are other areas where we don't know what the reality is. That is part of the process of discovering it. And the debate between us is that you think that you already know what the reality is because it was already discovered in the past. And therefore, these experiments contradict the reality. Whereas I am saying we don't know. You may be right. But as of now, I refuse to accept that somehow there is a reality that we know exists such that transgenderism contradicts it. We don't know that. That's a debate. And so just simply saying, but this contradicts reality does not, does not decide the issue because the issue is about what is that reality. Right, and that's, I left that part out because of time, but the, the vital issue is what is mankind? It's all about a robust anthropology, and that's what we ought to talk about. And your comments, Peter, indicate you affirm some sort of human nature. And in fact, the very enterprise of talking to the next generation, to younger people, assumes that the apparatus of education can be intelligently conveyed and intelligently received, uh, which means there's an, a commonality there. That commonality is human. So then the question is, instead of talking, you know, we talk about human rights, what does it mean to be human? That's where I want to go. So I, I would agree with you in principle. And I think that we can know some things. I can, we can know that if we injure that which is healthy, that seems problematic at the very least. I am not sure that we know the limits of injuring something that is healthy. For instance, we got a lot of healthy people in here and I'm sure that We've got a lot of people who could use one of their kidneys. So maybe we ought to you know, damage the
these healthy people so we can help others. A medical science can do that in order to help people be whole. And we say, oh no, we won't do that because that is not respecting who everybody in here is. So when we're looking at what are we chopping up on a person, we need to look at things that are a little bit more um, holistic. At least that would be what I would go for. And I also don't mind someone telling me how they wish to be called because that I would do out of respect. Well, I think that's, okay. we have this gentleman has been waiting a while, but I would say that kidney transplants don't create renal failure in one person to the advantage of the other. It emphasizes both. Well, it's not intended. What's your name? My name is, uh, my name is Junior. So my name is Junior. My, my question is to Richard Klaus. Uh, it's about the Abrahamic God, uh, of the most largest, the three most monotheist religions in the in history we have today. Do you think on the basis of what you said, uh, you said truth, exists and it can be known? Mm -hmm. Do you think he's an equal guy on the basis of an equal natural starting point for both what we consider as male or female? I'm not sure I understood the question. Can you help me un unpack it a little bit? He said truth can be known. Exist? Exist and can. It can be known. Right. So in, you start by co quoting the, the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, Based on the Abrahamic God, do you think he's an equal God in terms of the natural starting point on both the male and female? He's an, he's an equal God as a starting point for both male and female? Yeah. Are men and women equal? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, like the natural starting point for both the, the male and the female. Are they equal in terms of your well, Abrahamic God? Well, before I answer the question, I'll just, the, the whole issue of being truth, truth can be, truth exists and can be known. I think many of us on the panel would agree with that. I was just saying that actually is, it comes from Jesus as well. Um, some, I was trying to deny and work against those that would want to um, say there's no such thing as truth. That, you know, and because once, once we go there, and Peter, Peter obviously he said. No, I'm asking in terms of. I know. I'm the just, Bible now. And so you, so now you asked me a biblical question. My presentation didn't revolve around that aspect, but I'll answer. In terms of the biblical data, you know. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says that God created man male and female he created them so man male and females are created both in the image of God they're equally valuable in his sight in that in that way and so does that answer the question is image it and likeness. image and likeness yeah there's and we can debate about you know theologians debate about what what that is and all that the, the details of that so, so do you believe that's true based on the Bible or do you believe it's true based on reason I think both I think the Bible is reasonable so, so if, let's say if you were born in India, would you have been a Christian or would you have been the high probability of you becoming a Hindu or something? I have no idea. Now that, that's an interesting counterfactual. If I had been born in India in the 18th century, I wouldn't believe in quantum mechanics either. It doesn't mean that quantum mechanics aren't true, or at least an approximation of truth. I wouldn't have believed in the, the, the germ theory of disease if I'd been born in the 15th century, you know, in, in someplace else. And so, so the, the question that revolves around, well, if you've been born someplace else, you wouldn't be a Christian. Yeah, perhaps not. But that, has nothing, that, but that does nothing to tell us about the truth value of whether Christianity is true or not. We'd have to talk about what are, what, what are the standards of truth and how we'd go about you know, talking about that. And so simply talking about whether I was born in a different place or time does nothing to really help address that issue. So, so it goes back to the, the point about the, the gender equality. Uh, it tries to bring out the point that male and female are not equal in terms of the biology, but uh, as Dr. Uh, Lulu, is it? Lupu. Peter Lulu stated about uh, the, the mind, the mental, being a product of the biology. From a, from a biological standpoint, I know uh, your, your biology influences your, your psychology, mm -hmm. and technically you act, you, you, uh, you act based on your psychology. Right. So, well, if, if the question is, are men and women equal in every respect? The answer is obviously no, right? And that's why no culture has, has ever sort of come to that. It's not tried to have men birth their babies. So, so I mean, and so that, that, that's, a, that's a biological substrate of reality. We can, we can know that, you know, so now you're talking, you asked me a question about are they, 
before, before God in terms of their maybe significance, in terms of value. And that's why I was answering, yes, create the image of God, male and female, image and likeness. And so the values that is there. But in terms of the created reality, there are, there, are distinct, there are distinctions that every culture has recognized throughout the history of the planet. So, so don't you think as civilized people in the 21st century we should be able to notify these differences and try to bring it to an equal point, create some kind of a... By removing all the uteruses? I mean, I, I want you to think about what, when, we, when we use language, we're using it pretty imprecisely when we talk about make everything equal. What does that mean? So if you're talking about maybe in a certain domain or a certain realm, I, then we might want to say, well, yes. But in, a, in, a, in a certain realm where tend to, uh, you get corruption, kind of power tends to corrupt. Uh, for example, fem ladies are not allowed to vote. Don't you think it's a, a kind of cultural starting point to be more ethical and more civilized than what we brought up to believe or than what we, uh, we believe in because we believe it? Don't you think as civilized people we should be able to recognize these differences and be able to act more civilizedly and try to fill in the gaps between these natural standpoints? We need a standard of what civilized is, right? But if you're talking about do I recognize there's been growth, like for example in the history of our country in terms of equality between the sexes, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to recognize that, that there's a growth. And it's going to be according to some sort of standard. And so that, we're eventually going to come back to, to that always, you know, what's, what's going to be the standard of our ethical evaluation of what we think is civilized. I, I don't think we live in a civilized country when we do what we do with the unborn. I'm not, I don't want to turn this into a bit about abortion, but we, we talk about these things, you know, in, in, in these ways. And we, we do some uncivilized things in, in, in that regard. And so we'd have to have a standard of what we call civilized. civilized. It's not simply because well, we're, we're the standard, we're, we're on the cutting edge of what civilized is. We have to measure it against some objective standard. Otherwise, we're left with sort of a postmodern truth claim. It's just, well, it's just anybody's value, and it's sort of relative. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name's Cody, and I just wanted to thank the panelists real quick. Uh, I heard a lot of great points. Personally, I am on board with uh, the respecting autonomy, but I just had a quick question for this side of the table. Um, I forget who specifically mentioned it, but someone mentioned uh, overseas and in state, uh, people who are uncomfortable with extra limbs or having a hand or being, uh, being able to see as opposed to being blind. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering where would the line be drawn between becoming or being transgendered and all the rest of that? I'm not certain where we can draw the line. Uh, we do have to, if, if we're looking at uh, biomedical ethics, we have to recognize that the physician has an obligation um, as part of their training to do what is good for the patient with the recognition that there's certain kinds of training that that physician has had. And that's going to shape the physician's worldview. Uh, I don't know of any physician right now in the United States, and it's probably just because I don't know all the physicians, um, who would cut off someone's leg just because they wanted to hobble around on one leg. Um, I don't see that as a, um, a, a realistic thing for any of our physicians. But I don't know in the future just how we're going to set up what lines we do draw. We um, need to look cross-culturally, and um, especially with you know, dealing with sexuality and um, those kinds of very personal identities. We need to recognize that our way of looking at men and women is not the only way to do it. Uh, even if we look at uh, history, for instance, Katahuyuk, um, some of you may have may be familiar with that. That was a, a place where um, we did have equality between men and women as far as we can tell. But we had a different attitude towards men and women at that time, or at least that particular place did. I myself have lived out of the country and I have seen personally a different attitude towards male and female and all of sexuality. 
some of that has got to be brought into our country and looked at in a more holistic fashion where we, are, we see a, a patient not as just male or female or partial anything, but as a person. And that may help us discover what limits we need to take. But we also have to respect our physicians and what limitations we need to allow them to express. Just because somebody goes into a physician and says, oh, I want to change sex right now, you know, my biology doesn't fit, doesn't mean that that physician has to go ahead and operate. The physician may not have been trained that way. That we should also respect. We need to be able to, to be willing to take a look at all of the parameters, all of them. And it is a difficult kind of, I, I've seen people go through this choice. It is a difficult choice. Uh, one friend of mine introduced herself at her, um, her daughter's uh, wedding shower and said, oh, I am the bride's father. And uh, I kind of looked at her a bit and said, oh, okay. And then we talked a bit about what it meant to be part of a family and to go through that kind of a change. Obviously, her daughter accepted her, even uh, her ex-wife accepted her. This woman was acceptable, totally, by everyone there, and had gone through a great deal of consternation and just struggle trying to live in our particular culture. It isn't an easy decision. And no matter what side, whether you're saying, okay, people can go ahead and make that decision, or no, people cannot, we've got to recognize that some people are not going to be whole human beings unless they are free to make a decision. And I'm not sure which way to go with it or what limits to place. I don't know if that helps, but thank you. You can follow up later on yeah, class. I, I, I likewise don't know what the line is. Uh, and part of the reason that I say that is going back to, to the approach that I've taken. Uh, we, for a long time, assumed that what identity is, is fixed. We already know what it is. There's nothing to really look into it. But gradually, we learned that that's not the case. And uh, I, right now, would say that, no, you medical professionals should not cede to such a request because we are unclear what the mental state is in order to ask that request, okay? Uh, but again, once we look at identity, questions of identity, uh, we don't, we, we, it's unclear, it's at, at least I don't know whether we have any things that we can say they are fixed. There are maybe certain things partially fixed or factoring, but I think it's a mistake to think that we know what the identity of each person is and that's the end of the story. That's why I have no answer. Um, it kind of seems like there is a lot less sureness on this side as opposed to this side, but um, sureness, you're not very sure of much. Certainty. Oh, certainty. Thank you so much. Oh, much less certainty on this side. There we go. That's much it. less. Great. Um, but quick Google, you can find that trans people make up 0.6% of the adult population in the U.S. Now, that's from the Williams Institute of UCLA. And within that population, uh, the suicide rates are at 40%, I believe. That was provided by Richard Claus. Um, outside of assisted suicide by like a medical physician to ease suffering and pain, what is one thing that is almost always associated with suicide? 
it's mental illness, since you don't want to answer. But we all agree on autonomy, which is, you know, okay, like, hey, um, you're beautiful, your beautiful friend. Now, she waited until she was an adult, and she was absolutely sure. It's a great thing, you know. Consenting adults, whatever, I don't care. But, and I, I don't think anyone else really should either, but when it comes to, like, being forced to use certain pronouns under the threat of fines or jail time if you don't pay said fines, that's kind of like making me watch what those consenting adults are doing, and I'm not into that. Now, if we um, are going to laugh at the necessary sacrifices of hundreds of thousands of individuals and their lives through the French Revolution, like this is going on to another analogy, because you said you don't know where to draw the line. Let's look at communism where millions and millions have died. Do you draw the line at millions of who we all agree the, elite, the most suffering people and group in this are children that can't really decide for themselves or aren't autonomous and able to decide? So where, like you still haven't come up with a certain line to draw. Do any, can anyone answer that? I can answer you one aspect or maybe a couple. Um, and uh, first, uh, I'm not sure that I'm in favor of the idea of punishing people that uh, Jeff mentioned, uh, the law that punishes Incorrect people. use of pronouns. Yeah, it's already yeah. taken place in Canada. There's a psychologist from the University of Toronto Jordan Peterson, who has actually like gone viral essentially because he protested that. And he didn't, he didn't do it in a rude manner. He just said, I'm trying to speak to her at a rally. And she said, that's not, I'm not, I'm not a her. Like that's, don't call me that. And like that video alone sparked a huge amount of protest because he was getting right. yelled at trying to speak with a young lady. Right, and, uh, and uh, so I'm not sure that I'm in favor of that. And part of the reason I'm not in favor of that is because I know something that uh, history documents very, very clearly that very frequently certain movements go to the extreme. That too is something we have to learn and find out, oh well, that's too extreme. That's a consequence that is too extreme. How many sacrifices for that to be found? Well, how many sacrifices you want in order to discover the, the cure for cancer? History. There, people die, without a cure, they're dying anyway. You're acting like we have to sacrifice people to find a cure. Uh, no, we said, we always, as I said, every change has a cost. Okay, now, we may anticipate some costs, but in most cases, we can't anticipate all costs. The issue is this. Do we know ahead of time what is part of a person's identity, what are the limits, and what are not the limits. So, for example, giving women the right to vote might have had huge cost. Letting women go out and work might have had huge cost. We, we may not know what the costs are, but there are costs. We know that. But sometimes we balance things out and we say, okay, this is worth implementing and then we hope that we can take care of the consequences and adjust things accordingly. In many cases, we don't do that very well. But uh, that doesn't mean that the move was not right. How, m how many people do you think we should sacrifice to abolish slavery? Do you have an answer to that? No, but I know there is a modern-day slave trade in Libya going on no, right no, no, now. Yeah, I'm saying as, an, as a le legitimate open institution that is accepted in the, throughout the world, which it, how it was forever before it became internationally illegitimate, which is why it's done in, in hiding. But I'm asking you if, you, were, if you wanted to ask the question, how many lives should be sacrificed in order to abolish slavery in the, in the world, or at least takes a huge step towards that so that it becomes illegitimate, internationally unacceptable. How many lives? Do you have an answer? Nobody has an answer. How many lives should be sacrificed in order to abolish Hitlerism? 
Nobody has an answer to that question. Let's Why? Because human history has a cost. Okay, let's talk, I'm sort of going on a different trail with this question in line of reasoning what you're saying, but I ended my talk with the harms that are done to children. And I just want to, I guess, two things I'd like to maybe ask you and Jean as well. You know, uh, number one, could we, could we begin to agree on some of the dynamics that say we ought not to be allowing children age five to seven and some whatever age to begin to begin their transitioning since we, we, we do have some studies you know, I know I know truth is always in front of us you're saying Peter but there but we obviously scientific you know methodologies rely on that we we have some testable statistics we have some testable studies that have been done that the one I brought up for example that's one you know could, could we begin to make some agreement about how children are involved in this Cause I, don't, I don't think we want to sacrifice children and the second thing you know since you you agreed you weren't a postmodernist and I agree I know I know you um, would you be will are you willing to also fight as hard against those postmodernists and the arguments put forward by postmodernists for gender, you know, gender ideology? Because some of them are putting forward, and some of and some of those ideas are being codified into law based upon that kind of false philosophy. As far as children are concerned, I think that we come to, we agree because my whole basis is based on autonomy, and since five year olds don't have uh, a level of autonomy that enables rational consent. Uh, of course, I don't, I don't think that children, that children should not be deciding about a whole host of different things, certainly not these. So that's, I agree that's good that. to hear, because we've, 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 there's actually been cases where somebody was a, a renowned uh, uh, expert on the issue of gender identity and uh, actually worked with the, for the diagnostic manual. Uh, it's in my notes, I forget his name right now. Um, Kenneth Zuckerman, I believe. And he was fired because he, oh, after 30 years of leading the, uh, this gender institute, you know, helping children work through gender dysphoria, but because people began to call that, that's reparative therapy, which it's not. He, but that was the charge made, and, and because, because you're seeking to do this. And he himself says, on adults, I, he says, I'm happy to help them transition. So he, he would not be where I would be on that issue. But he said, with children, we ought to be helping them to align with the identity, with their biological identity. And he says 80, 95% of the time, that happens in the studies he did confirm that. And so, but in our culture already, we have now civil sanctions and he was ousted out of his job, that was shut down, and so we have coercive powers being brought to bear against that viewpoint. I, I want you, I, let us be aware of that, you know, that, that that is out there. And I do believe that's motivated by the ideology, ideology that says there really is no truth and we dictate reality that if a child wants to be that, he is that. And we ought to accept that. Yeah, and, and I, I, as I said, I'm not a fan of postmodernism. I had that, the difference is not that I don't, it's not that I don't think there, there is a truth. There is objective truth. It's just that the process of discovering it is very complicated. But there are certain boundaries we do take in the process. And that is a case like that. We have good rational reasons to not uh, uh, just allow children to make these decisions and go on them. So, and if postmodernists disagree with that, well, too bad. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but extreme cases, once again, it's, it's a bad idea to draw general conclusions from extreme cases. You know, it's really a bad idea. Everybody can go, and especially today, on, online, find the most extreme cases on every side of the issue, and then you say, oh, well, look at this extreme case, so, you know. Um, but the principles undergirding those extreme cases are being codified into law, and that's, that's a concern. And that is a concern, and I, and I, as, I as I answered, uh, I disagree with, uh, uh, you know, having legal sanctions against people who call somebody this way or that way. Uh, I, I, think, I think that, that that is, once again, pushing things too far. But let's remember that uh, when you drive, you know, sometimes the momentum takes you in the wrong direction. You don't, you don't want to go there, but it does take you there. And then you say, oh, OK. This is That's why we have brakes. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, well, sometimes in social, in social affairs, uh, brakes are sometimes uh, come a little bit too late. So Not too late, but late, and then we can have to go reverse. So would you, as a pro-LGBTQ advocate, 
be willing to have a disclaimer with your opinion and your obvious uh, huge amount of knowledge. You know, I had you as a teacher. I, I know it's all there. <laughs> um, would you have a disclaimer so as to try and prevent that steamrolling and that runaway break lines cut kind of ideology? I'm not exactly certain what kind of a disclaimer you're looking for. Um, my basic approach to anyone is that we reverence them as persons, as autonomous individuals, if they are autonomous. If they're not autonomous, we still reverence them. And we try to do what we can to help a person be a whole person. I might not know all the time exactly what that is. And I'm comfortable with that. So would you say you're more of a micro or meso level as opposed to a macro? Like micro, and this is social work. I don't know where my teacher is. She'd be proud. But micro is individuals, you know, in yeah, the family group, yeah. community. Or meso okay. is community, like city, town, state. And then macro would be like federal, national level. I'm not certain if, are, are you I'm, asking? I'm going against the legislative legislative okay, factors. Okay, that's what I needed was a topic. Um, legislatively, I, I don't see that right now legislation is going to be of any help at all. Um, if someone legislated me to uh, care for everybody in here, I think they would be absolutely absurd. Um, if somebody told me to call you him or her or I'm going to jail, I would tell them I, I don't agree. Um, because being courteous to you, to me, says I must try to use whatever phrase you're comfortable with. Um, that's just courteous in our social life. So I don't see where laws would help on that. I do have some problems with some of the things that we do in our society or on our planet. Um, for instance, I don't like men being automatically, uh, well, it's not done now, circumcised. That's not their choice. In some places, circumcision is considered child abuse. France, for example, um, and I recognize that. All right, it took us a long time to come to that conclusion that that kind of clipping out of a male is abuse. Are you trying to explain you are 12? <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it well, doesn't I, apply. I just, I just want to mention. We've also got... <laughs> Thank you guys so much. You have a great day. Yeah, you too. Uh, she touched on my point. It was for Richard. Um, you are against the changing of the body and whatnot, but in Genesis, as you quoted, God told Abraham to circumcise or he'll be cut out or outcasted. Mm. And I, I just don't see the correlation with you're not okay with it now, but then whenever a man in the sky tells you to do it, then you can do it. And another thing, you care so much about children, but whenever, I don't know which council it was, a council, um, whenever the crusades were happening, they sent a bunch of children to get slaughtered and died on the way over there. And you don't like that, do you, that they did that? Did they have a choice? But, I mean, but regardless of their choice, do you, do you like that, that, that they did that? That they died? No, I, yeah. I, would, I, don't, I don't like children dying. I don't either, I don't either, because okay. I care for children, because I think we have a standard of, of human flourishing. Uh, so I think we're agreed there. So I, you know, whatever they did in the Middle Ages, about the, I, I can say I'm not beholden to that every you know, application of, of Jesus' message or misapplication in that instance. So yeah. you, if you want to point to atrocities in the history of the church, um, I can join you. We can, we can pinpoint some. I'll probably point some out. You don't know. Um, and so I have no problem with that. You know, uh, the church has not been some pure institution. Um, Going back to the scriptural revelation, though, in terms of God, God has prerogatives that we don't. He's not, you know, even the way you describe him, 
is, is would be from my, from my approach, in my worldview, completely inappropriate, simply a voice from a man in the sky. He is the creator of all things. He upholds all things, and his presence is here right now, upholding the very breath that's in your lungs. And so to speak of him that way... That's your opinion, though. I understand, but that's yeah. what I said, from my worldview, from my worldview. Yeah. So you asked, me, you asked me about what I, what I thought. Yeah. And so that he can do that. And so um, he, he gave that as a mark of the covenant for his people. And so that, that's why it's to get, con, con, continued in the Jewish tradition, you know, um, for, for centuries, for thousands of years. And so that'd be, that'd be what I'd, I'd say to that in terms of... So what's the evidence for that? What do you mean, what's the evidence for that? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the whole... I mean, you, you ask the evidence for any worldview, what's the evidence, and say, now, give me in 30 seconds, you know. Um. Uh, that's that's going to take about three days. No today. scripture has <laughs> evidence. No, it's all that, vocational, and then... That's, that's simply not true. I mean, the fact... It, that, that, that's such a broad claim that it's true. It's false by definition, because to say there's no evidence, I, all I have to do is provide one piece. All I have to do is provide one piece of evidence, and of then... Scripture? that. that uh, you know, that's contradicted. Well, sure, for example, the fact that Jesus existed as a historical person. Sure there is. Number one, the Gospels themselves as historical documents are evidence, but also you have writers like Josephus and Tacitus that, well, that think, speak I, of Jesus. Wait, and so, but my point here was that a, a quick, facile dismissal of to say, well, no scripture has no evidence. That's a, if you go back and you do your basic logic, all I have to do is provide one counterexample and the claim is shown to be false. So we might talk about, well, what kind of evidence? How good is the evidence? How extensive is the evidence? And that, that's a larger debate about how we're going to compare worldviews. Okay, I think what he's asking is, does your scripture have evidence of being handed down by an all-omniscient God? And not even my scripture has that. Revelation. In other words, yeah, this is a whole different kind of... That's, and. I wouldn't defend my scripture either, and I'm not in his club. Well, that'd be foolish because it doesn't claim to be that, number one. I had somebody one time ask me, why would you think the Bible's God's word and not this menu in a restaurant? I said, well, one reason, the, Bible, the, the menu doesn't claim it. Let, let's begin to talk about <laughs> we, you have to You have to engage with what's in it. It's not simply a formal claim of, okay, this, this book, without engaging the contents of the book, and the worldview that becomes expressed in it. So this is a larger issue of how we're going to adjudicate between different worldviews, which is a larger discussion we can have probably in three minutes. In the fall. In the ba yeah. Basically, in the fall. it's begging the question. In the fall, we're going to have God in the and we're going to discuss... What was your point to the circumcision of Abraham and... So what, what was your point? I mean, oh, I, no, I was just asking, like, oh, the contradiction between, like, you not you being opposed to it now, but whenever like you reference Genesis, it's basically okay in Genesis, but not okay right now. I think if God commands it, then it's in that in that instance, I think ah, it's okay. it's okay. You so know, so but he, he, he gives that's a, that's the answer I give. Oh, okay. um, he gives us the values and the object uh, objective values we're to live by. Oh, so. Okay, so if God gives you. Yeah. Well, that again is a larger worldview question. I. I so, like, I, I yeah. guess that's what I'm asking. Like, so if God says it's okay, it's okay. But if I, if she says it's okay, it's not okay. But it, it, those are great questions, and we'd love to be able to come back and talk about that. The actual answer is, and let you go chew on this, because we got some other people that yeah. want to ask questions, is the Christian God of the Bible is true because of the impossibility of the contrary. That's the reason. Look at Kant, and then put what I just said into how Kant talked about transcendental arguments. That's the answer. Okay. Um, I have actually one comment to say before I continue on with my question. And my comment is, you guys keep talking about the mortality rates that correlate between trans, uh, being a transgender person and, uh, well, committing suicide, killing yourself. Um, what I want to say is that you could actually relate uh, homosexuality with trans, uh, transsexuality because how do I say it? Uh, more t don't you think that mortality rates could be higher up because people like you and you and the boy in the blue that just left, or that's right there, decide that the other person's view is not correct? Uh, like, if you were to call me, I'm transgender. Um, the boy that just left, he called me a she. I didn't correct him. 
But yet again, that didn't make me feel good. Don't you think that has a factor to do with the higher mortality rates that somebody is not or refuses to say your correct pronouns, that refuses to see your reality? Yeah, I, I think that that's a very insightful question. And um, that's important to understand that that which is in society oftentimes ostracized can cause those kinds of situations. However, we do have data, we have studies, and it's- Okay, but I'm not asking about no. data. I'm asking about, uh, about, do you know what goes on in a homosexual person's mind and a transgender person's mind when you go ahead and tell them that what they're doing is wrong? I thought you Don't you think that mortality rates correlate with that? They, they do not. And, they and do. There's been studies that have shown that the, um, like, bullying or unlawful- That's uh, bullying unlawful discrimination or those kinds of things do not correlate with the higher incidence of self-harm and suicide. So you're uh, telling me what no. I felt right now as that person called me as she was completely invalid, invalid because no. data doesn't say it? No, I, th I think that you are in touch with what you're feeling, but the question yes, then becomes, are you going to be morally responsible for those feelings and not let the feelings govern behavior? That's exactly. the question. And so my okay, point that, is... Okay, that was not my question. That was completely not my question. You're actually going around it like you've been going around all the other questions well, and it, quoting other people. Well, if, Don't you know, you if you're think, just going to label an insult, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm sorry. I'll give you me, one more me. chance. Here is, here is, here is how to, how to un understand the debate. I think Ilder's point is very simple. He says, let's take the data. Assume for a moment that the data is correct, whatever is the suicide rate. Now, he says, how do we explain the data? Well, there are alternative explanations. One is the process of psycho psychology, which is Jeffrey's, uh, Jeff's explanation. The other one is social. Because of the stigmatism and so forth and social pressures and so forth, that causes higher uh, uh, suicide rate. And then Ilder asked, how, how do you choose between those two hypotheses? Well, there's studies that have been done that have actually tried to do that. Okay, so, so that, that's my point. That's okay, there, there's so, studies so, that have so demonstrated. This is, this is an empirical factual question. This is an empirical factual question. But I think that I, if I may, if I may, Ilder, jump in a little bit and say there is a high mortality rate among poor people, uh, a suicide rate among poor people. Are you going to join us? in the crusade against eliminating poverty completely by taking from the rich people and giving it to the poor people so we eliminate suicide, high suicide rates among, uh, among eliminate Thank you. poverty altogether so that we eliminate the high uh, uh, suicide rate among, among poor people. I think the answer to that question is, is that means matter. So the right goal, if we would agree on the right goal, the question would be the means. And that's, that's the question we're dealing right. with here. Exactly the means right. matter. So is the, is the right means to actually say to uh, transgender people, you are absolutely wrong, you are, uh, need to actually be treated in a, in a more like a mental illness, rather than try to see if you make a choice, again, children is a different story. If you make a choice, uh, let's see if we can as a society uh, support these choices and then see whether perhaps they will flourish more rather than assume ahead of time that they must be wrong because we have a conception of what identity means. They must be wrong and therefore this must be some sort of a sick, some sort of like a mental illness, which is kind of like what this. Well, again, it's not us saying, saying it's mental illness. It's the experts who are both people who are some Christians, some Christians, some non-Christians right. that make those categorical decisions. You know, from Rich and I's perspective, the question would be, what's the best way? What are the best means of loving our neighbors? And that requires a number of personal interactions. It requires rejecting false theories of anthropology, such as personhood theory. It requires affirming a robust understanding of anthropology. It requires bearing with people, and it requires telling the truth in appropriately kind, gracious, non-quarrelsome way. And metaphysically, if we are convinced that mankind, ex and everyone on this panel has said this today, has said, well, how's we, how we treat men and women? as how do we treat boys and girls, presupposing the very metaphysical reality that we are defending on this side of the table. 
So what we're simply saying is it doesn't do anyone any good, nor does it love our neighbor to begin using metaphysics that don't com correlate with uh, that which is real. So you're saying so you're saying that it, it, it okay. So you're basically saying that your reality shouldn't be changed in order to respect somebody else because it's your reality and it's your point of view and therefore it should be respected. It is my point of view, but it's not, quote, my reality. Reality is reality whether I assent to it or not. And but the same reality is true doesn't have a starting point. I don't know why you keep saying that reality is a certain thing. That nothing, is, nothing is absolutely certain. Your reality and my reality are completely different. They, can, That's they, not can't, true. they can't be the same. Like, well, that, uh, you that, were raised in Christianity. I was also raised in Christianity. I was not. You weren't? So oh. you made a mistake. I was, I was, I, I was raised in Christianity. Yes, sorry. Well, I, I have another question. Do you believe in the Bible? What do you mean by believe? Uh, do you believe that the things that are said in the Bible that are written down are an absolute truth? I believe that the scriptures uh, of the Christian faith are the revelation, the special revelation of the triune God. Okay, so you would tell me that nowadays a lot of those morals and those values should be incorporated into uh, modern society. I didn't no? say that at all. Okay, but... And you... I would reject a wholesale cut and paste copy method for a whole host of reasons. I mean, my PhD is in theology, so I'm, I'm willing to go as deep as you want to go. No, so no, no, no. Ask I, the question. I'm completely fine. Um, so what, I, what, what I'm trying to ask you is uh, a lot of people take uh, a lot of the things from, from the Bible as to be complete and utter truth. And uh, a lot of the things that are done in the Bible are completely correct. Um, so you would be saying that in the Bible, I'm, I don't actually know names, I forgot about it a long time ago. There, there was a story about a girl that got raped and then she had to marry the guy that raped her. There's also stories about slavery and uh, how, uh, as far as I remember, somebody was getting pummeled by rocks, so on and so on, because she was a, sorry, because she was a whore. So, a lot of those things are refuted anymore. Even, even the fact of, uh, of several, several men, or just one man, having several different wives. All of that has changed with modern society, hasn't it? People well, don't do it anymore. Yeah, Why? I, because I, I, normal standards change. So this is yet another thing that, we, that at least for me, one has to get over. Um, you also, you, you've studied the theology. I have yet another question. Uh, you know that the Bible has been written and rewritten and edited and re-edited according to um, kings and queens and uh, in order to make nobility the top how do I say this, uh, top commander. They, they, they were given the authority by God. Yeah, that's not true, so. Exactly. Yeah, there, yeah, there. yeah that, that, that narrative's not true, so. I, I'd love to answer all those questions. Yeah. Let me just say one thing. I, I just re since I recently had this published online, you may be interested in a, a piece I did on slavery. You asked, you know, a whole host of shotgun of things we can't deal with, but I just did a little piece on slavery and talked about that. It's on the Christian Post. If you go Christian Post and you type my name and you'll find my two articles that are posted there and one is on slavery. You may, you may find it interesting. I actually take a law that got brought up in Philosophy Club on Fridays at one o'clock if those are interested in Philosophy Club. And uh, I said, let's take a look at this in its historical context and how it's developed throughout the entirety of scripture. And what does the Bible say about slavery? So it's a small piece, but it'll give you a flavor for how that an answer at least one of your objections might be answered. And I think there are, other, there are answers to the other ones as well. Uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Elizabeth Heath. Um, my question is directed um, for Dr. Jean. Um, <clears throat> however, I do want to start by saying that I do believe that reality is arbitrary, so the basis of reality is not an argument. Um, when we're talking about science and whatnot, that's a whole other su subject. It's not reality, it's science, um, in my justification, because reality is arbitrary. Um, science is ever-changing. Um, but, as I said, my question is for Dr. Gian. My, I'm only trying to clarify and see what your guys' positions are, not to interrogate you. My question is, 
uh, your entire argument, doctor, it was about um, bodily autonomy. You wanted uh, that we have control over our own vessels. Um, so essentially, at the basic level, when we are doing uh, transgender surgeries, we are removing uh, limbs of people based on their discretion of self. And I would like to know, um, is body modification and becoming um, different in any way, including, um, as we used earlier, the um, becoming disabled or et cetera, or even things as um, tattoos or piercings? Um, is, how is those types of body modifications, the extreme cases, and also the normal cases, um, any more different or inappropriate um, on the basis that we have um, bodily autonomy? So my question, just to shorten it and make it very clear, um, is we condemn behaviors such as um, ch chopping off your finger for no good good reason, because we're, we're, we're basing our, our transitions on reason. Um, so when transgenders switch their genders, they're doing the same thing. They are taking a limb off of their body or they are replacing that limb. So where do you stand on that issue? Are you just very open on um, all body modification or is it exclusively um, this transgender? I would be open to some body modification. Okay. Uh, there's, we still have a ways to go in order to be able to figure out what it means to be a total human being. Mm -hmm. um, in some cultures, when somebody dies, you cut off part of your fingers. And yeah, that's a modification and it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, you're supposed to do that. Uh, it's, you know, there's, we have to be careful to which one so you can still um, defend yourself. Okay, so you're not uh, open to all um, options. All Just options, we don't know uh, the, uh, we have n nothing to go on to really tell us that this is a really dumb idea or a good idea. But with things like transgender, we do have some experience now. Mm -hmm. And for many people, it's been a very good idea. They are now able to contribute to society in ways they could not before. Mm -hmm. I have asked some people who are trans, said if our society was more open to a more fluid gender identity, would you have found the surgery necessary? And they weren't sure. So this is why I would look at our society as a whole and say maybe there's some things we have to change as a total people. We have to learn to accept whatever views of themselves others have and not classify them in this God said so. Obviously, I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to worry about what their God said. Well, yeah, that's true. Yes, I was. I was a Catholic Christian. I was a nun, and I taught theology for 18 years, um, both New and Old Testament, uh, among other things. Uh, so I'm kind of familiar with what the text has to say. Um, let, me, let me just interject. Usually, not always, but again, usually all or nothing turns out usually to be wrong. Usually, not always, because then I'm going to be all, again all or nothing. It turns out usually that it's really wrong, uh, but it's very difficult for us to live like that. Yeah. You know, we want either it's this or it's this. And sometimes it is like that, but discovering that it's like that may take a long time, so yeah, so that's, it's that's essentially a response to your thing. Okay, and so I guess the last leg to that question I'm, I'm asking is... Um, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, body modification in itself, um, 
we cannot deem all cases based off of extreme cases. We, we've established that earlier in, in, in the discussion. Um, however, to say that many people have had success with these surgeries and also have had success um, as transgenders, for just as many, there is still the statistic that there are children dying, children being hurt. And so um, I guess that's why I'm, I'm asking you because you, you have this um, view on autonomy um, that I, I don't see throughout the rest of the panelists where we are self-governed. And so when we make a decision like I want to take off my leg or I want to take off my left pinky toe, um, at what point do you consider body autonomy our own? Uh, a doctor, Jan. We have, or sh for the most part, <laughs> I think we should have total body autonomy, which means no one can insist that we follow certain physical um, rules. But I do find but that this contradicts um, signing as a U.S. citizen to be under a contract of a government because a government mm -hmm. has control over your body autonomy and what happens with you, which is why you go to a judicial system to dictate mm -hmm. whether or not you were um, I didn't assaulted, I didn't say that our system is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and our willingness to accept each other's autonomy is not perfect. Mm -hmm. We do not have respect for each other totally. We do not really reverence each other totally. Okay. And if we can ever come to that, you know, that point, a lot of our questions would simply not exist. Okay, so my last question, should body autonomy and government be different? The government... Be separated. Uh, so whether I want to be Rawls or Nozick. <laughs> uh, you can tell I've been in philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in some cases, both of them are correct. Mm -hmm. We do have a social contract. We do have to care about others. Um, but so that would be the Rawls part of me. The Nozick part of me says, my body is my property. And no one has a right to my body, mm -hmm. whether to cut it off or not. Okay. Uh, and here's, we've got a lot of questions with this autonomy thing in medical ethics. You know, do I have a right to my own life? Can I take my life if I choose to? The government is going to say no. Well, I'll just avoid the government if I'm really determined. Um, but I can't necessarily say to someone else, yes, I want to die, you have to help me. Okay. Right, so we've got some you know, conflicts and, and struggles in here that we're gonna have to work with. Okay. And we don't have all of the answers and all of the, the proper things. We okay. don't know where. Okay, I think I understand but your position, thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel and my ex-spouse of six years is a trans woman and I just wanted to thank all of you panelists, every single one of you for sharing your views. Uh, gentlemen over here, I appreciate, uh, I forget your names, all of you, I apologize. I appreciate you say that we should have compassion for people with gender dysphoria and sir, I, um, I appreciate how you care for children and everyone on the panel cares for humanity and we're all I feel like trying to have the same goal of bettering everybody everyone in our community my question is to clarify the declassification of um, miss you said or ma'am sorry uh, that trans okay <laughs> that trans women or trans people have to be classified as um, having a mental disorder to get the, the sexual uh, reassignment surgery. I, according to some of the research I've gotten. Okay. Um, I remember that the APA declassified something recently, right? Kind of yeah. similar to homosexuality. So 
Um, is it still considered a mental disorder in the guidelines? Do we know? According to the research that I have right now, um, it is, homosexuality is no longer a mental disorder. Um, but the trans, in order to get insurance to cover it, we've got some money issues here. And this is where I would suggest that maybe we have to change our system so that if you need medical care of whatever kind, maybe you should get it if it will help you be a better citizen. Um, and you know, this is something we do have to take into consideration. Uh, as far as I can find out, in order to get any, to get through and to do everything legally, you still have to get that label doesn't have to stay there forever, and nobody has to take it serious, but the insurance companies like it, and so does, we've got some areas of the government that also care for it. But okay. I don't think anybody is uh, taking it too serious right at the moment. And I, I can see it from, at least from some of the research that I have, that th probably the next issue is going to if we can solve the economic problems, um, we'll take that out as long, along with homosexuality and some of our other um, deviants. Because, let's face it, um, celibacy is no longer classified by most rational people as being um, sexual deviance. I think what you're referring to is the distinction between gender identity disorder and gender dysphoria, which APA, I think, is saying that's a, a downgrade, a less severe sort of malady or pathology at that point. Again, that's a label. I'm not saying I agree or disagree either way, but that, I think, is which, to which you're alluding. I think still with respect to children, though, the standard's a bit, bit higher, and that produces a whole complex of issues that we've discussed this afternoon. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you so much for everybody who's here.